I'm introducing Evan today. Uh, Evan Pritchard first came across my radar in 2017. The Ethical Action Committee was delving into some aspects of American history, some forgotten and ignored areas. As a matter of course, we had special lectures and site visits. One was to the African burial ground and the second was to the Museum of the American Indian. The latter whose name re raised questions with me on who can claim what regarding a continent of people numbering in the millions who had inhabited this land space for thousands of years. In any case, I resolved the issue by referring to the peoples of this terrain simply as the indigenous peoples. To help our group better understand the continuous cataclysm, which much of their European contact must have been, I was directed to Evan Pritchard, who had a reputation for directness and scholarship. He was our lecturer and he was outstanding. So, <clears throat> so who is Evan Pritchard? Evan Pritchard is a man of the, I'm gonna blow this, I know, the Mlecoc, uh descent, and excuse me for that uh, era. He is the director of the Center for Algonquin Culture. He teaches classes about native indigenous and indigenous peoples in America. His talents have been received and heard in American studies. He's also, also in philosophy and ethics. He has lectured at Maris, Pace, and Vassar College, uh, as well as John Jay, Columbia, SUNY, Ram and Ramapo State. I could go on, but you get the idea as is his own personal tradition for scholarship and the preservation of native culture. Mr. Pritchard has interviewed native elders all over the country. He is a one man library and researcher to help preserve the oral tradition of native peoples. He is the author of over 50 books on native topics and lectures frequently. Ladies and gentlemen, today, you will have a walk through a pristine forest of American history where few have cared to look, where many have avoided to keep their mythologies intact. Your trail guide will be the very capable Mr. Evan Pritchett. Mr. Pritchett, please take us on this journey to a new understanding. We willingly will go with you. Well, thank you, Muriel. It's nice to see you again. So um, I'm gonna go into scholarly history to kind of maybe help straighten the record. So I wanna start by saying happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Now, more people are talking about it now and thinking about it, especially President Joe Biden, who on October 9th of this week, declared Indigenous Peoples Day a thing to be observed every October 11th, regardless of the day of the week. He said, and this is an interesting quote, today we also acknowledge the painful history of wrongs and atrocities that many European explorers inflicted, inflicted on tribal nations and indigenous communities. Uh, Joe Biden said, for Native Americans, Western exploration ushered in a wave of devastation, violence perpetrated against Native communities, displacement and theft of tribal homelands and the introduction and spread of disease and more. By the way, he also promised to help protect environments that Native people today re rely on for their survival. So I'm gonna read a lot of this because uh, I wanna to stick to the, the facts as best I can. So this is not the first Indigenous Peoples Day, but there is something different about it this year. So I asked Joan Henry, the Native American singer and actress, some of you may know, <clears throat> why this Indigenous Peoples Day seems a bit more dynamic than before. <clears throat> and she said it was had finally taken hold. And what a wonderful turn of phrase, taken hold. But to what end? Just to have another holiday? Or to set aside a day for research to discuss our nation's history as regards the Native American and the many forms of injustice uh, that continue? So let us dedicate this day to taking hold of truth and justice to examine the roots of racism in America, which seems to have started the moment Christopher Columbus stepped on the land and started enslaving Native Americans the minute he got off the boat, seven on his first day, by the way, he was just warming up. The spin doctors have spun enough wool. Now it's time to remove that wool that has been pulled over our eyes to look around and see what has been happening to all of us. The finding out of truth and the telling of truth, no matter how painful, is the beginning of justice. Putting ethics into action, it is a key component 
in the Algonquin Indian way of the heron, a peacemaking process. And according to C.T. Vivian, who told me this personally, it was a part of the nonviolent process taught by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in the early days of the civil rights movement to seek out the truth first. Truth be told, it has never been more important. So it is no secret that lies have been told here in the land of the free. They've been told in schools and books and on the street. And there are big lies and small lies, and you can rank them yourself in order, starting with your favorites. And remember that other people have different lists than you and see things differently. But if we all discuss what truth is, and I hope civilly, I would hope that we get beyond the lies, the lies that block the path to peace and justice, and the lies that block the path to a more ethical society. Now, as regards the Trail of Tears of the Cherokee and other tribes, President Jackson explained as the benevolent policy of the US and because Native Americans, quote, have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire for improvement required to live in peace and freedom, established in the midst of a superior race without appreciating the causes of their inferiority they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstance and long disappear. I think there was a trait of uh, a trace of white supremacy somewhere in that sentence. You can look it up. President Jackson said this in his 1833 State of the Union address. Now lies come in different packages and they are packaged and marketed like cigarettes to children to form a cohesive story of what happened, a convincing story, but one that is false, like the story that cigarettes make you tougher and cooler. The pack of lies I want to address today on this beautiful Sunday morning, just before the dawn of this new federally recognized Indigenous Peoples Day, is the one about Native Americans that say that they were few in number and just lived hand to mouth and day to day, wandering around speaking gibberish, that they couldn't have communicated because they couldn't speak English. They couldn't have known where they were until the white man gave them place names like New England, New York, and New Amsterdam. They couldn't have traveled without paved highways. They couldn't have had a religious experience except inside a church or held a philosophical conversation without having read Plato. So you might not see these lies in recent print, but they fill the vacuum where other countries have real history. And I hear people say these things, by the way. People to this day say that Native Americans didn't deserve to be here because they were uncivilized. And in fact, they were here thousands of years already. But one of the best definitions I know for civilization, outside of our Algonquin community, by the way, is gleaned from the pages of Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher who said that it means to honor your covenants. In other words, to keep your word, keeping your word. And who kept their word better than some of those woodland sages and sachems who followed a strict code of honor? Certainly not Peter Stuyvesant nor his predecessor, William Keith, and not Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> One of the biggest lies is that there were so few Native Americans that they only utilized a few acres of land and the rest went to waste. But this is not true. In my 30 years of research on Native land use, and you could call it geography, I rarely, if ever, found an American town or city established before World War II that was not built on top of significant Native American towns and villages. And there were thousands of them in between. The most accurate history map that's out there in the public eye is the one of North America, you may have seen it says Indian country from coast to coast. People in Ohio today are told that there are no Indians in Ohio. And I use the Indian word just to, I guess, make it more impactful perhaps, even though they are not from India, but uh, they're told there are no Indians in Ohio and not one but today, most of our towns and villages in this state are built on top of Native American sites. So what better way to make a Native American village or a population center even disappear from history other than to build on top of it? Over in Connecticut, Yale and its surrounding city of New Haven <clears throat> were built early in colonial history on top of one of the more crowded areas where throngs of indigenous people of different tribes lived and traded together. You probably never heard of Weepawag, and you can thank Yale and the town of New Haven for that, because that's what was there. Philadelphia covers about 10 Unami Delaware towns, which you probably also never heard of. Now, Genoan-born Christopher Columbus, since he seems to be a topic today, 
he set the trend in 1492 and he did a lot more than sail the ocean blue let me tell you he worked the natives of bermuda and hispaniola literally to death in the fields and established trade he was the one that established trade in the new world of slaves and responsible for the death of thousands while claiming to spread the Ten Commandments, one of which I vaguely remember had to do with killing people and not doing it. He was arrested as a criminal in 1500 by his own patrons, the Spanish. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt established Columbus Day as a federal holiday on October 12th, 1937. Now, to be fair, some Italian Americans say uh, October 12th or Columbus Day should be Italian American Day and not Columbus Day. And some claim that many or most of the 51,000 unnaturalized Italians were released from internment camps on October 12th, 1943, at the end of the uh, war with Italy. Hence the connection between this day and Italy. And that's a topic of good discussion. It makes sense to declare the previous day, however, October 11th, 1492, because that was the last day indigenous people had any peace and quiet. And that's the day we're proclaiming. One Italian explorer most overlooked, unfortunately, is Giovanni de Verrazzano, who did not kill Native Americans, but admired them. And he arrived in New York Harbor, 1524, went through the narrows that bear his name and explored the harbor, coming in within a mile of the spot of the um, ethical side of Brooklyn. So maybe October 12th could be Verrazzano Day and Italian American Day. When it comes to Native Americans, you don't have to look far geographically to find examples of injustice. The Nyack Indians of Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, kept having troubles with the Dutch. So they moved inland and then place to place. Finally, they gave up and were welcomed as refugees at Tappan Hills by the Tappan Indians at a place now called Nyack, New York, after them. The Marietzkowick of Brooklyn, a leading group home to several Canarsie chiefs, were attacked in a bloody massacre by the Dutch, an incident the Dutch later said was uh, a case of mistaken identity, oh, a misunderstanding, a big oops. And that was the twice land that were on and they were driven off and that's now called Borough Hall. They too went to Nyack and other places to seek peace. Speaking of the Tapan tribe, they were ones who first stepped forward, actually we'd call it a nation more fairly. They stepped forward to help the Dutch getting settled at Manhattan Island. They gave them a cave to shelter in at Hoboken, New Jersey that first winter and then taught them what and how to plant what nuts to gather, such as walnuts and hickories, how to get tannic acid out of the acorn, how to grow corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters. But then on the night of February 25th, 1643, Governor Keeft got mercenary soldiers, foreigners, and members of his own cabinet, including the Secretary of Treasury, Cornelius Van Tienhoven, to go to massacre the Tappans and their allies at Pavonia, which is now Jersey City. They killed about 120 of them in that night and 60 more at Corlier's Hook. They were there because Keeft had invited them to take refuge to seek safety, but that has never been forgotten. On August 30th, 1645, he gave away Algonquin land to his friends who had participated in this massacre and resultant war in the form of a patent which leaves it up to the bearer to find the native owners and pay them, or at least that is the idea. So Horn's Hook on Manhattan, Lower East Harlem across from Roosevelt Island was gifted, gifted to Seibolt Classens in this similar way. Now Classens had married the widow of one of Keith's friends who was killed as he was massacring the indigenous people of Pavonia by the sword. And this apparently somebody fought back. That and the gift of land strongly suggest that Seibolt Classens had also participated in the massacre and that was a Dutch custom to marry the widow of a fellow soldier in your unit who died alongside you. And also another tradition to be paid in land, but there was no record of him in the battle because the battle supposedly was done in secret under the full moon, etc. There is no record of Classen's paying Chief Willem of the Rechuanas people, the land of sandy small streams for that land. But we do have records showing Classen's involved in at least seven petty lawsuits while building his house, taking full advantage of his political connections with Keith. Even if he did pay Chief Willem, it was customary for treaties around Brooklyn 
and Manhattan to include wording to the effect that the sellers, the Native Americans, had perpetual rights to come back and pick peaches, gather eagle feathers from underneath the nesting trees, and to strip, strip bark from certain trees to make medicine and make wickiups or wigwams, and even birch barks. Now, this is recorded in a book that people should read, Henry Stiles' book on the history of Brooklyn from 1683 to 1884. That was published uh, not long after 1884. As today's Ramapo clan chief Vincent Mann says, this indicates the natives had no intentions of leaving Manhattan or what is now Brooklyn. They had permanent access stage passes to all the good trees. Most of those were signed on the influence of Governor Verhulst, who was before Keeft, and Keeft was much more strict, to put it nicely. Keeft became known at this time as the corn stealer. He would have had, he had his men intercept Native American wagons full of corn along the roads from the native planting fields at Garden City in central Long Island and from East Brooklyn, the area near LaGuardia now, and then bringing them to the East River to be sold. But that corn was grown to be sold to the Dutch for modest amounts of wampum and New York's governor Keeft got it for free because he stole it, but it cost him in the form of this nickname, which still is echoed to this day, corn stealer. That same year, February 24th, 1644, at the full of the moon, Keefe sent his warlord sidekick, the Englishman John Underhill, alias John Vanderhill, his phony Dutch name, and leader of the militia that had burnt down the native fortress at Pequots at Mystic, Connecticut, with all the Pequots inside. And he asked him to do a little favor. So he attacked a large settlement inland from Pound Ridge. There was a large maple tapping festival celebrating the maple tree and thanking it. And so 700 died trapped in that blaze. It was roughly the first anniversary of the Pavonia massacre. <clears throat> the site was several hours past Pound Ridge by foot. It must have been Katona or perhaps specifically Whitehall Corners. See, the attack was unprovoked. And of course, there was a counterattack. So various battles did not turn out favorably for the Algonquin. So on August of 1645, the Dutch declared victory and ownership of much of the land by right of conquest. Then on September 15, 1655, a Wapenger Sungsqua, which is a female chief named Ta Takiniki, this is per O'Callaghan's history, walked into the newly fenced yard of the Secretary of the Treasury, Cornelius Van Tievenhoven's house, the same one, guarded by the Chief of Police, William Van Dyke. And she ate a peach off the tree that she had been eating from childhood. And we can, be, we can guess her family land deed included language to their right to access to certain trees, which was typical. As she plucked the peach, Van Dyke threw open the window and shot her dead with his blunderbuss. Then there was a war as prescribed for the assassination of any chief, male or female. And then another after that, these were called the peach wars. And the natives got the upper hand for a moment, but then the Dutch got reinforcements and had revenge. In the early 1660s, war broke out with the Esopus Indians southwest of Kingston and organized under Captain Krieger after much delay and went out to defeat the Esopus Muncie, who, by the way, are closely related to the Canarsi. They found Dutch and Muncie women picking corn together in the fields, doing chores together, conversing in trade language and being very loving and friendly to each other. Captain Krieger warned the white women to run, proceeded to burn down any villages he could find, and the Asopa said that area ran to the mountains and never returned fully to that village. On May 16, 1664, a new treaty was signed, basically at the point of the sword, this time under Stuyvesant. And it said in the treaty that we take this land by right of conquest. The British then invaded the Dutch, did to the Dutch what the Dutch were doing to the natives, September 1664, and they took over the colony and many of the Muncie ran for a place on the Susquehanna River called Onokwaga, but some stayed and intermarried with the Dutch discreetly. The Nichols Treaty then was signed October 7, 1665, with the Asopus Muncie paying them for stolen land and promising safety. <clears throat> 100 years later, the Treaty of Easton was signed, and chiefs signed perhaps under duress to remove their people to places west of the Susquehanna where they would not be molested, places like Onaquaga. Guess what? During the revolution, during Sullivan's campaign, 
the Mohawk war leader Joseph Brandt took up hiding at Onekwaga, and so all the village and farms were burnt down, including two beautiful Muncie villages, villages protected by the treaties of Nichols and Easton and Fort Stanwix and others. It was weeks later, the campaign, in that campaign, that they found the first sweet corn ever seen by Europeans, and that is the corn we eat today. It was found at a Seneca village not too far from Onaquaga, just further down the Susquehanna. A few ears were saved, and then all those fields of sweet corn were burnt down. And so that's how we end up where we are today with that. And um, I just want to go ahead with this. They also went up in uh, westward to Muncie, Indiana, and they built a beautiful city of cabins in Muncie, Indiana, and then were pushed off as settlers took over the towns by force. And then many Muncie and Shawnee became members of the Shawnee Baptist Indian Mission in Kansas City under the patronage of Mayor Isaac McCoy, who was a missionary, with promises of state protection. But then Andrew Jackson became president and he started his Indian Removal Act of 1830 with Kansas City, removing them to Kansas and then Oklahoma without any provision for their welfare. Now, some went to a mission at Turner, Kansas, which is now the Shawnee, the town of Shawnee Mission, Kansas, but many former chiefs and orators died on their journey to Oklahoma. So, by the way, next time you root for the Kansas City Chiefs football team, stop to think about that. So, some of those were refugees from the Battle of Point Pleasant, West Virginia of 1774, where Cornstock and his men were unjustly imprisoned on their own land and then shot dead in their cells. So uh, that land was about 300 feet away from some land, some property that George Washington was trying to sell. And so his property value went up, but maybe you don't wanna go there, I understand. Now, according to Brent Stonefish, a Muncie from Muncie Town, Ontario, the blood of Brooklyn's Canarsie people runs in the veins of those Ohio Delaware as well. Some scholars say the Canarsie spoke Muncie the same language that they were close allies. And it was the Canarsie whom the treacherous Peter Minuit swindled out of lower Manhattan because Canarsie lived there too for the price of a pig, 60 guilders. So the good news is that it may have never happened. But why do I say he was treacherous? Well, the Dutch were often at odds with the Swedes of New Jersey in those days and in warfare, Minuit was the governor for part of that time and then he was fired and later emerged leading the Swedes against his own Dutch kinsmen in battle. So it leads me to doubt his word about the sale of Manhattan. I see maybe he was a shoplifter of history caught without a receipt. So why are we talking about this? Because it's Indigenous Peoples Day and uh, it's a good time to talk about the ethics and the absence thereof. And Western ethics is based on individual free will and Native American ethical systems are also based on individual and tribal sovereignty. So they are similar in that regard with of course the indigenous people finding ways to incorporate nonverbal parties such as plants, animals, and rocks and the air and water into their system of ethics into the conversation to the use of the wisdom keeper as a member of the council who speaks for those <clears throat> who have no voice. Now today we should all be wisdom keepers. For these two particular sides, of America's uh, state of being with state and tribal laws that protect the rights of individuals, why then has the rights of Native American individuals and tribes so often been abused? Wounded Knee, Sand Creek, Standing Rock, it is a long list. Did these, did these abuses serve the greatest good for the greatest number? Did they pass a majority vote? And is that really how you justify war? Well, Henry David Thoreau did not think so. And I think that perhaps my own opinions may be biased in my answer. So rather than answer that, let's have yearly discussions, perhaps daily discussions, but every Indigenous Peoples Day, which is on or near the anniversary of Columbus arrival, actually the day before, we'll call it Indigenous Peoples Day and dig into the facts as we know them. So were all these removals and massacres lawful and warranted and justifiable? Or was it all about money, land, and geopolitical power, and perhaps a, a little touch of white supremacy? At the same time, let's discuss the history of the Ind Indian residential school system. Let's compare and contrast the strategic effects of the removal and massacre and acts of war 
with the strategic effects of residential schools, weakening native culture, reducing its knowledge, its pride, erasing its language, reducing populations, taking land, property, and so forth, and in many cases, turning future native warriors into American soldiers to quell disturbances on reservations. These are all legacies of the school system. Those hundreds of unmarked student graves recently found on residential schools in Western Canada and in the US probably contain the bodies of Native American youth who fell into five categories. Let me just list the categories. One, death by natural causes, but unreported, therefore not so likely natural, but we don't know. Two, death by contagion due to poor living conditions. Three, suicide victims. And we have to ask why these students felt it was their only option. Four, death by result of repeated tortures and a lack of medical attention or sanitary abortions, excuse me, unsanitary abortions, which happen frequently. Five, death by murder. That's an important form of death. These schools persisted into the 1980s in Canada. And I have spoken to some of the victims who verified as accurate even the worst rumors of abuse and torture. And there are other ways that abuses continue. So of course, I wanna add that there is another way to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. That is by researching and celebrating the remarkable accomplishments of Indigenous people, both here in the US and Canada and on other continents. Sports, music, poetry, environmental activism, all these are areas which Native Americans have repeatedly excelled. That would be an ethical thing to do. So maybe next year, but for this year, I'll leave these thoughts and uh, facts for you to research yourself, to discuss with your friends and families, and to see what truths lie beyond these somewhat discouraging facts. So that is my, uh, <laughs> my sharing today for the Ethical Culture Society of Brooklyn. So thank you very much for letting me speak.